So I'm going to take the poem to heart there about stepping in our own authority. And so uh, I've struggled a little bit with this Mother's Day talk because there's the expectation of what I'll talk about and what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so <clears throat> we, have a, we have, used to have a mother's group that met every week when our kids were little. And one of the mothers had a very uh, uh, um, successful music career. She was the conductor of a symphony and um, she loved her career. It was very fulfilling, and that was her main goal in life. And then she meets the man, this man that she discovers that she really starts to, he's great. Wait a minute, I think I love him. It's a big moment for her. She's never done this before. And so they're dancing, and she says, okay, this is the moment I'm going to tell him. And so she said, we're dancing. It's going to say, take up my, I get my breath, and I just say, John Feldman, I love you. And he looks at her and says, my name is John Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that story. <laughs> and that's how she met her husband. <laughs> and, uh, I love that story because... We have so many images of girls or women when they fall in love, they're writing their name with the guy's last name, and that's such a big part of how we see women. And for her, this was just like a side detail, you know? It just really wasn't that important what his last name was. And that's how I feel about Mother's Day, <laughs> which is women are very different people. We're all very unique, and so we have these very small, sometimes I feel a little claustrophobic, and I find myself getting a little resistant around Mother's Day, a little rebellious. Um, <clears throat> I was reading about the history of Mother's Day, and there's a long history in, with Greeks and in England, but our Mother's Day in this country was started by a woman named Ann Jarvis, and she actually had no children of her own, but her mother had been a social worker. This is in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, and was really uh, pushing for women to be honored. So, her, so Ann Jarvis, in honor of her mother, really pushed for this to become a national holiday in America. And she pushed and she pushed. And finally, in 1940, 1914, Calvin Coolidge signed it into a law, and we had Mother's Day. By the 1920s, Hallmark got a hold of it. <laughs> and it became very commercial. She was completely devastated by that and actually tried to rescind it after that because she said, well, you're missing the whole point. And, and she was very upset about what it became. What I found interesting about, that I never realized is that she was very specific that when it was called Mother's Day, it wasn't Mother's plural day. It was Mother singular apostrophe S. Her intention behind this day was for us to honor our specific mother, to just take a moment, a day, to think about what she's done for us, write her a letter, tell her what we appreci appreciate about her, and that's it. Just make it very simple, a simple thank you for how you were a mother to me. And since every mother is unique, that is going to look different for every person. But instead, it has become this big Mother's Day, this grand collective Mother's Day. And what happens when that when we start getting into the collective Mother's Day, is now we're into the collective idea of what it means to be a mother. And what is our image of motherhood, especially in America, especially in our primarily Christian theological background history, the main mother image is Mary. And that's the story of a woman. So if you were raised in a Protestant, so, so there's a Protestant energy of our country, which was Mary was useful. <laughs> she had, she, she had not only had a son, but she did a pretty good job raising him because he ra was raised to become the Messiah. So she was pretty good at her job. And then you have the Catholic version, which she becomes the queen of heaven and she's untouchable. She's virginal. She's, she is, she feels great compassion for the suffering of the world and yet is never touched by the suffering of the world or the dirtiness or the sensuality of the world or the practicality of the world. She's above it all. So these became the image and the stories that we tell. And we've, so now we have this exalted image of Mother's Day and we have, I always feel like Mother's Day should be Mother's Day. Oh! <laughs> Just like, they're so, we're so holy and saintly. But we have to remember all that is to be a mother is you have to be born with a certain biology. <laughs> and if you have a certain biology, you can have kids. 
We don't have a special Mother's Day for dogs or cats or for, I mean, there's a biology that we have, but there's an uplifting of that. And what I believe is happening is we feel there is a sacredness to it. We feel the divine in it, but we don't yet know what those stories are. We still haven't fleshed out those stories. So my passion is about what are the stories the women are, we are telling ourselves. We have the Mary Magdalene story, which is really coming to fruition, fruition a lot more in the last 15 or 20 years. But for most of our history, it's really been this Mother Mary story. So uh, in honor of my mother, my mother was not, um, my mother was, did all the, she was an at-home mother, four kids, all our meals were at the table, very traditional. At the same time, she was a fighter. She was always fighting for community events, always for causes. And so, in her, and so to honor my particular mother, I'm fighting for a cause today. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about. So I was going to talk primarily about Dangerous Beauty, but last week I asked if anyone had seen it, and nobody had seen it. So I'll touch on it, but I'm going to talk about that in terms of the greater idea of stories. What are the stories that we're telling? Dangerous Beauty is a movie that was made <clears throat> in the uh, 1990s, and it's about a Venetian, oh, a woman who lived in Venice, Italy, courtesan in the 16th century. It's based on a true story about a woman named Veronica Franco, and she was w a woman who didn't have a lot of money in her dowry, so the, only, the way that was really afforded her was being a courtesan to make money. And back in the 16th century, thousands of women were courtesans. This was a way to make money if you didn't have money. <clears throat> and the other thing about courtesans, and this, is it, this wasn't just in Italy, this was also in, in Japan and China, that many of the times it was the courtesans who, could, who learned how to read and to write. They were part of the politics and the intelligentsia. So Veronica Franco actually has books that are published. So when the movie came out in the theaters, they had her verse being sold in the bookstores. She also had edited books that were published. She also had written letters uh, fighting for causes that were published. She did have a tryst with the King of France. Bless you, Michelle. Um, no, it didn't have the world impact that it has in the movie. It's much more glorified in the movie. We like to expand our stories, make them into legends. But she did have a tryst with the King of France. She was operating with the high and mighty and had a lot of freedom and incredibly bright. And other poets, male poets, found her very threatening because she was getting a lot of money given to her from her patrons and getting stuff published. So he, there was one particularly, he's in the movie, Mafia, Mafia, Mafio, um, Franco, who would write verses against the courtesans, and then she would defend the courtesans. So, and actually, she does go in, in real life, and in the movie, she goes in front of the Inquisitor uh, twice. In the movie, it's only once, and it's a big trial scene. In real life, it's just between her and the Inquisitor. And I was reading an essay by a UCLA law professor who writes about uh, courtroom scenes in movies, and he said, in real life, the, the dialogue between her and the Inquisitor is fascinating, and she's incredibly well, arti very, very articulate in defending being a courtesan because she's had to do it for so many years with this guy who was always attacking her. So for eight years, she was doing really well. She was, she was <clears throat> high, up in her prior high up in the field and having a lot of freedom. But by age 34, her, pa her main patron died. She had, un you know, in the movie, she has no children. In real life, she had six children. Three survived. Um, survived infancy. And so by 34, when her beauty is going away and her patrons now passed away, she had lost a lot of her money and was struggling financially for the, until she died at 45. So a courtesan had a, had a, could have a nice life while they're pretty <laughs> for, a, for a short period of time. And they had a lot of freedom and political influence and then they departed. What I love about this movie, though, I, I love her story. I love the trial scene, what she says about God being in the world. God is sensual. God isn't just high and mighty, transcendent. God is in form in the passion and in the pleasure that she had experienced of both the body and of her mind. That was God to her. And she's calling this forth. So that's incredible in of itself. But as I was watching the movie, what I started to notice when people were asking me why I loved it so much I realized I was all the women in that movie. She's the main character, but as they were showing the wife, played by Naomi Watts, who is a beautiful, blonde-haired Australian actress, and I didn't even recognize her because in her 
primness. She lost the beauty because she's, I want to be pure, and she's the wife, and I'm just here to have your children, which was the, the divine mother. That was the Mary story. I want to be that person. And you could see how constricted she was. That She was going to be taken care of for the rest of her life. She didn't have to worry about money, but she didn't have the freedom. Most women back then that were married were illiterate. Their lives were about being the wife, being the mother, being used for their genetic, uh, the the between nations, the power that they had when they connected families. But they themselves were not self-expressed people. And <clears throat> But I think there's a part in all of us, all women, who feel that innocence, that purity. We want that innocence and purity. So I was watching a wife who I, did, I thought I wasn't supposed to like, but I liked her too. I'm like, well, I feel that too, and I love the courtesan. Oh, and that sister, I so relate to the sister. Oh, and the friend, I really relate to the friend. The mother, I relate to the mother. And I'm, it's like a smorgasbord of feminine energy of a, move, of, of, of a movie. And I thought, this is so rare when I just feel so infused with the feminine face of God and that there are so many faces. It's not just one face. It's not just one box that we put them in. And so there's two things. One is that's interesting about just the time is we see the impact that stories have on culture. I think there's, no re there's a reason why Jesus told, most of, uh, told so many parables because stories are so powerful. They, they create. We have, well, I won't go into the, our little chart over there, but we know the creative process. The creative process is first you take an idea, then you start putting emotion to it, then you put feelings to it, you, and you bring sound to it, music and visuals. The more, you, the more stuff and sensory you create around an idea, you're going to create it. So that's what stories do. They create a world. And so we have this story of the, of the virgin birth, that took over not just our culture, but European culture, and now and we get to see how it played out in history. It actually had impact, this story, this archetype of the Virgin Mary, and that was the only story that women had, the, the goal to be was not to be like a Mary Magdalene, but a Virgin Mary, and we see how that played out culturally. It wasn't just the men forcing women to be like this. Women wanted to be like this. The power was in the story. And so we need to start telling the stories. And why I love this particular story is because it was written by a woman and she turns the story around rather than another period piece where we see women all dressed up in their corsets talking about how they want to get this man to be their husband. She made the main character the courtesan. She, made, she turned it around. She turned it around and she said, we told, we're going to tell our story now. <clears throat> I met a woman on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, she... She's a writer. She had just written a movie. <clears throat> and I wish I could remember the statistic. It was just a couple months ago. She put out how many women scriptwriters there are in Hollywood. And I, was, I couldn't believe it. It was tiny, tiny. And so I start paying attention when I see movies, who the writers are. And often there's women writers that go along with the man, men writers. But movies that are primarily all written by women, directed by women, are very rare. So even today, we are in a, a time of 2014 with a lot of freedom, but the stories we are telling are still very masculine-fueled. And it bugs me. <laughs> and it bugs me because I think it makes a difference. So just as we see how powerful that story of Mary, this pure, virginal character, played in culture and played in women's lives. When I was a girl, I, uh, I have three older brothers, two of them love science fiction. And I'll never forget watching a science fiction movie with them. Actually, I think one of the first ones was Star Wars. And I just like, you know, I didn't like it at all the first time I saw it. And they loved it. And they loved all science fiction movies. And uh, so I found myself um, watching a lot of science fiction movies. And like many people, I've acclimated myself to it. I got it. But my natural first girl feminine instinct was, why would I want to live in a world like this? It's steel, everyone's hard, they have silver, and there's no emotions. They might have a little bit of emotion in a movie, but that's usually where my brothers would try to fast forward it. <laughs> oh, that's the boring part, let's move on. <laughs> And almost always, the future is depicted as ugly. The planet is devastated, or there's big wars or violence. I, have, I actually have a spiritual uh, friend. He's a mentor to me who I respect greatly, but we disagree on this passionately. 
which is his favorite movie, is The Matrix. So I went back to see The Matrix, and I'm like, that's just more guy stuff. It's just guy stuff in the future. They're all fighting each other, and, 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 and the planet is devastated. Of course, it's always devastated. Or if, it, if it's not devastated, it's very metal. There's a lot of metal. <laughs> You don't, what you don't see in a lot of these movies about the future is softness, tenderness, gentleness, warmth. People and human relationships have not evolved very much in our future. We have a lot of technology that has evolved, but human beings haven't evolved. And this is, we've been telling these science fiction stories about our future since the 50s and on movies where we have the visual, the music, the... the, the all the senses going about what our future is going to be. And then when people say, well, these terrible GMOs are chemicalizing food. I'm like, well, yeah, because that's what they do. Only Have you ever watched those science fiction movies where you just need a pill? You don't even need to eat food anymore? Because, and, and the planet does never ha- doesn't have any natural resources. We look at our world today and we say, how did we get here? And I said, have you been looking at our movies about what the future is like? There's no feminine voice in that. We, it's all technology driven. All it's, We can't wait to see the science fiction of all these gadgets. And what do we have? A world where gadgets are growing and growing. Connection. I might connect with someone in South Africa, but I might, not connect, I might forget to connect with my own son because, shh, shh, I'm doing this. <laughs> On NPR, they, in fact, it got my attention. They were interviewing all these young kids about their parents and technology. And and these, you hear these young kids, I want to throw the phone in the toilet, I want to smash it. They're just angry at the stuff because not only are kids on the phone, parents are now on the phone. We're disconnecting from one another. We're having some type of connection, but it's an aloof connection. It's not really deep. Like I've met people in South Africa and Maryland, but if they're in trouble, I'm not going to come, run, I'm, not, I'm not there to, I'm not part of their lives. It's, it's a superficial connection, and we'll, we miss the deeper connections. So my call out today on Mother's Day... <laughs> no, is we need to be telling our stories, because every woman in here, everyone has... First of all, mother energy is the divine feminine energy. I talked a, lot about, a little bit about that last week, and everybody has it. It does not have anything to do, it's, it's in our biology but transcends our biology. I know for me when I was a child, I was playing with dolls and taking care of dolls. I didn't need to have a child to feel mothering energy. That when we have that feminine energy, we just mother, we nurture, we take care of. So it's in all of us and tends to be in women with, phys- with people with phys- women bodies more. I would say generally, we have more feminine energy than men. But we need to start talking about those stories. We need to, we can't, even jobs, teachers still are getting paid less. All those jobs that are feminine, energy oriented, financially are not even getting close to paid for those jobs that we consider masculine. Ministry is very interesting. More and more women are going to ministry. Harvard Divinity School, Yale Divinity School, Princeton Theological Seminary, more women are going now than men. And as more women are entering into the field, salaries are going down fast. Because there isn't the value where communities used to be, the church used to be about coming in and telling people what was right and how they should behave. That was, a, that was the very direct sort of masculine energy. And as women, communities are becoming more communal and sharing and feeling, now we got, now we got the feminine energy. Economics are going way down. We see it over and over. But here's what I don't believe. I don't believe anyone's doing this to us. We are the creators of our story. We are the creators of our reality. We are not victims. And so no one can do this for us. No one can tell the stories for us. It is up to us within our families, with our friends, and as publicly as possible, whenever we have a chance, to tell our stories. I was just reading Joseph Campbell. One thing he said, there are very few stories about women, sort of the hero stories of women. And that's not because they're not out there. It's because they're not being told. And so we may be 2014, we may have a lot of ideas of what it means to be a woman, but we're still not speaking up. Our voices aren't being heard. You know, it's interesting, for years, before I became a minister, I had the same dream for years, which is I couldn't talk, and and I I have a dream where every time I tried to speak, this gum would come out of my mouth, and I couldn't, and it would just keep gum, I couldn't pull, I couldn't talk. And then I became a minister and started finding my voice, it was terrifying, but those dreams went away. If, see if you have dreams around your throat. Speak up. Find out. Find your voice. Especially us, you young ones. <laughs> F- 
Find your voice. Speak it. We need to hear it. This world needs it. Because we, I, I don't want those science fiction movies to come true. <laughs> So thank you so much for all the divine feminine energy. And so that's the invitation this week. Find the divine feminine. Look to see the divine. Get to know the divine feminine energy. Last week I was talking about using feminine pronouns just to see what it feels like. Anytime you hear the word God, use she, her. Just to experiment. Do the, the whole month. Anytime you're reading a book where he is supposed to engender both male and female, just start putting she, her. Just see what it feels like to start calling forth that feminine energy. Get to know it. Speak up, and we'll, we'll become this new heaven on earth that we are here to be. Let us pray. Yes. And today we honor that divine feminine energy that transcends all our ideas of what that feminine energy is. We let go of all our boxes and labels of what it means to be feminine knowing so many of these concepts have come through time from limited storytelling and now we are open to a whole new way of seeing we are open to that first cause idea that that idea that is before anything that has ever happened that has no past precedent that is brand new that arises from god herself that perfect idea arising from herself from her own stillness and silence within her being we catch those ideas we feel them in our energy body we feel the flow we feel the power and the grace the gentleness and the strength the tenderness and the power that she is feeding and creating and expressing and as we feel it we start to give face to it we give form to it through our words through our language through our music through our visuals we start creating and speaking from and as this one power this one presence that is pure love that is the divine feminine herself seeking to know herself in form as never before seeking to see herself in our bodies in our stories in our lives as never before we make ourselves completely open and available for her to speak her word as each and every one of us unique unlike anybody else powerful strong creative loving, free, tender, compassionate, soft, gentle. She is all of it here and now, sensual, abundant, prosperous. She is all of this now as each and every one of us in this room. And so I just give thanks that she is making herself known to each of us here and now that any area of our life that has been set apart, we now re-include into our awareness. She is all that we are, all that we are, the dark and the light, the up and the down, the good and the bad, the, the child and the parent. She is tenderly nurturing all life. She is unconditional in her love. She sees all equally with that heart open into infinity. She is love itself. And each and every one of us as divine manifestations of that love feel that pure unconditional love for all that we are, for our entire story. We see with the softness and the tenderness and the love and the wisdom that she is as us now. And so for the infinite good, I just say thank you, Divine Mother, for all that you are, for all that you have ever been and ever are becoming as everyone in this room. We are your becoming. We are here to say yes. And for this infinite yes, I just say thank you, God, and release this word. I just let it be, knowing that as it is spoken, it truly is already done. And so it is. Amen. <laughs>